at East Anthem Science looking at biochemical evidence for evolutionary relationships. Thanks to Sam Moyle for producing this PowerPoint. So the science understandings you need to cover, describe the technique of DNA-DNA hybridization, describe how evidence from the following techniques may be used. Sequencing for common proteins, e.g. cytochromes, DNA-DNA hybridization, DNA sequencing, and ribosomal RNA gene sequencing. So let's talk about some evidence for evolution. We can define species biochemically, and we can do that by doing things like comparing the sequences of amino acids and proteins, DNA-DNA hybridization, DNA sequencing, and ribosomal RNA sequencing. So here's just a quick example down here of DNA sequencing. We can look at a black bear, giant panda, red panda, and raccoon, and we can have a look at a specific gene and look at the DNA within that gene. And we can look for differences that are in those. The more differences there are, the longer it's been since these organisms shared a common ancestor. So if we have a look at the black bear down here, we can see we've got an A that's different here, we've got a G that's different here, an A that's different here, a G that's different here, a T that's different here. So there's several differences here that suggest there's a decent amount of time between the American black bear and the giant panda. If we compare the giant panda with the red panda, we can see we've got one difference here, two differences here, three differences here. So these would have separated off from each other uh, much more recently. So let's look at sequencing common proteins. So cytochrome C is a good example of this. It's involved in respiration and it's found in both bacteria and in eukaryotes. It's in the mitochondria of eukaryotes very specifically. It's a central component of this electron transport chain, so oxidative phosphorylation. And its job is it carries an electron in there. It's a very small protein. It's only 100 amino acids long, and it can be up to 104 in some organisms. And it's very small and it's very dis well distributed, so it makes it a good protein to do comparisons between species. So, for example, chimpanzees and humans, they're exactly the same. So there's no difference in cytochrome C amino acid sequence between chimpanzees and humans. So here we're looking at the 104 amino acids present in uh, cytochrome C in several different species. And here we're looking specifically at the amino acids that are making up that cytochrome C. If you look at this table, we can see we've got one difference between a chimp and a rhesus monkey, and that suggests they're fairly closely related. If we look at, say, the chimp versus the, what have we got here, the whale, there's 10 differences in cytochrome C. So that suggests that the common ancestor between whales and chimpanzees separated off a lot further back in time than the common ancestor between the chimp and rhesus monkeys. We could also compare hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a very common protein. It carries oxygen in the blood. And again, we can look at the differences in the amino acid sequence that produces hemoglobin to get an idea of our evolutionary relationships. So again, humans and rhesus monkeys are fairly similar, whereas humans and lampreys are very different. And that suggests that there's been a lot of changes in the amino acid sequence over time. And therefore, the humans share a much more recent common ancestor between humans and rhesus, mon rhesus monkeys than they do between lampreys. Let's talk about DNA DNA hybridization now. So DNA from one species is heated. And what happens when you heat up DNA? So when you heat up DNA, it separates. There's hydrogen bonds that are joining the two. If you add in heat energy, that can separate the DNA strand. So you heat up one species DNA, and then you add in single-stranded DNA from another species, and you mix that, and then you let it cool down. So why do you think we would do that? So when you cool down the DNA, it has a chance to form those hydrogen bonds back again, and then they'll stick back together. The two strands will stick back together. So strands with high homology will bond more tightly than those with low level homology. So the DNA strands that are very similar will bond together really well. The ones that are less similar will bond less well. Then we reheat the DNA and the poorly matched strands will separate much more easily at lower temperatures. So we can measure the temperature at which the DNA strands separate and use that as a proxy for getting an idea of how recently the common ancestor between those two species existed. This isn't a bad technique, but with the cheaper cost of DNA sequencing now, with more complex species, with lots of genes and DNA present, DNA sequencing is the much more preferred technique for comparison. So we've got species A and species B, we mix the DNA together and heat it, we then let it cool down, and in this case we can see there's not a close match for this section here. So what that means is it will require less heat energy to separate these strands back out. Whereas species A and species C, we mix the DNA together, the strands are bonded together a lot better. And what that means is it will require a lot more heat energy to separate out those strands. So there'll be a higher temperature for this species mix, species A and B, compared to species A and B. And that suggests that species A and C share a much more recent common ancestor than species A and B. So let's talk about DNA sequencing. So previously we covered DNA sequencing and how it works. It involves reading specifically the nucleotide sequences present in the species that we're looking at. 
Different species have different DNA sequences, and then we can compare them. The more differences you have, the more time has been present since those two species shared a recent common ancestor. So if we look at these three species down here, I have no idea what they are. If we look at the fingerprints that are being produced, and we've got our GATs and Cs here, we can see where we're getting differences in our letters. So here we have an A, here we have a G, here we have a G2 for this uh, nucleotide. Let's look at ribosomal RNA now. So rRNA is ribosomal RNA. And the question is, where do we synthesize rRNA? So we have genes that code for the formation of the large and small subunits of ribosomal RNA. And each ribosome has at least one large and one small ribosomal RNA subunit. The rRNAs are combined with ribosomal proteins, which are formed in the cytoplasm, in the nucleus to form the large and small subunits all together. So the subunit consists of the ribosomal RNA plus some proteins too. Once the subunits are formed, they're exported back to the cytoplasm so that they can be finally assembled into the ribosome. So in eukaryotes, we can have as many as 50 to 5,000 sets of ribosomal RNA genes. So that's a lot. And there might be as many as 10 million ribosomes present in a single cell because a lot of protein needs to be made and ribosomes make protein. In E. coli, which is a bacteria, there's seven copies of the ribosomal RNA genes, which synthesize 15,000 ribosomes per cell of E. coli. And why this is useful is that there's a significant difference between the domains in terms of archaea bacteria and eubacteria, the true bacteria, having different ribosomal RNA sequences. And there's also differences to eukaryotes as well. So if we look at the ribosomal RNA genes and compare them, we can get an idea of how long it's been since recent common ancestors were shared. So now we have another phylogenetic tree. So here we have our uh, common ancestor for all organisms. We can see there's a split between the bacteria and and the archaebacteria, and then eventually the eukaryotes being produced from another split later on between the archaebacteria and the eukaryotes. Now, the information for this is based on looking at differences between ribosomal RNA present in these species. So the more differences present in the ribosomal RNA genes, the further back in time those species shared a recent common ancestor. So animals, fungi, and plants here, we have a recent common ancestor back here that shared very similar ribosomal RNA. Whereas if we compare animals to methanobacterium, we've got a lot more differences in ribosomal RNA genes. So the most informative gene we can look at is the 16S rRNA gene, and that codes for the small subunit RNA present in the bacterial ribosome. This gene is present in all bacteria, and a similar form is also found in all eukaryotes. So if we compare the gene sequences in that 16S ribosomal RNA gene, we can identify different species. And so we decided that the cutoff point is 98.65% similarity. Any higher than that, we aren't able to determine the difference between the species using this sequencing technique. They're just too similar, and this is the resolution level of that sequencing. It's still pretty good for looking at broad differences between species. So how's the ribosomal RNA gene sequenced? So the gene is isolated and amplified using polymerase chain reaction. So can you remember the steps behind polymerase chain reaction? Approximately 100 to 600 base pairs of the approximate 1500 base pairs present are used and identified with a primer. And here's some examples of primers down here. So a modern version of Sanger sequencing is used and homology compared using electroferrogram sequencing. So we can compare the specific ACTs and Gs that are present between the two species. So let's do our check. So you need to be able to describe the technique of DNA-DNA hybridization, describe how evidence from the following techniques may be used. Sequencing of common proteins, DNA-DNA hybridization, DNA sequencing, ribosomal RNA gene sequencing. So today I'm going to science with the biochemical evidence for evolution. That's it for science today. See ya.